1 Corinthians 16, look at verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. The Apostle Paul closes the first epistle to the Corinthians by giving them several instructions to encourage them to be faithful in the ministry. In verse 13, we find four specific directives. Have a look at verse 13. He says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, and be strong. When he says, Watch thee, he means to be sober, be vigilant, be on guard, don't be sleeping, be awake. Don't be ignorant or simple. Be watchful and alert. And then he says, stand fast in the faith. In other words, be firm in what you believe regarding the words of truth. Not only defending the truth or preaching the truth, but we must continue to live out our faith, a living faith that makes a difference. And then he says, quit you like men. In other words, be brave, be courageous, be fearless, be men. Remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of love, power, and of a sound mind. God is looking for courageous men, not weak men. And those that are strong in God's grace. Amen. He says, be strong. Uh, this is no doubt to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know, if you go back a chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, the apostle Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Without God's grace, we cannot be all that God wants us to be. Amen. It's only by the grace of God. He says, it was the grace of God that was in him that he was able to labor more abundantly. How was Paul able to be strong in serving the Lord? Only by the grace of God. Amen. In verse 14, Paul adds a major component that, he, uh, that we all must, we all must have in our ministry. Look at verse 14. Let all, let all your things be done with, what's that word? Charity, Charity love. And you you look at perhaps a couple of chapters back, he spoke about how charity is the greatest and never fails. Amen. He says in uh, for verse 1 to 3, in first, uh, chapter 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt and have not charity, it profits me nothing. If we don't have charity in our ministry, then all that we do is in vain. In all things, this ought to be the very center of what we do, the very motivation, not only to God, but to others. Why do we serve the Lord? And why do we serve others? It must be done through charity or love. Now, in verse 15 to 18, the Apostle Paul concludes his letter by admonishing them purposely, giving them, you know, if you will, uh, an illustration, which is a household of Stephanus. He gives them a household to look at. Now, Paul did this various, various times in his epistles. He, as a matter of fact, in, I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says, hey, I want you to see the churches in Macedonia, how God's grace is upon them. But now, he, he, in this letter, he shows them an example of a household that was absolutely committed to the Lord. And he's not doing this so they can compare themselves among themselves, but he's just doing this so he can show them a model in which they can pattern after. An example. And we know the greatest example is the Lord Jesus Christ. However, there are those that are serving him and laboring uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ and their work ought not to be hindered. Because as you know, the Corinthians were carnal. And those that were laboring and on fire and hot, the Corinthians were perhaps susceptible to, uh, you know, discourage those that were serving among them. And we're going to see that in a moment because he, he does encourage them. I want to uh, speak to about, three, about three things from this passage tonight. An example presented, pursued, and praised. All in this passage, we want to look at this tonight. Now, look at, look at the first in verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, his household, that it is the first fruit of Achaia. So he presents them as an example. The members of the household of Stephanus were among the first converts in Corinth. Imagine that. You go to Corinth, you preach the gospel, and Stephanus and his house 
hold, he's just onto it. They believe the first time, they hear the gospel, if you, if you would, and they just want to follow the Lord and addict themselves, addicted themselves to the ministry, similar to like what happened with Lydia. Remember Lydia's conversion? She heard the word, she got baptized, and then she compelled Paul that he, he would stay at her house so she could minister to them. This is the same spirit that we see here. What a spirit to have. Amen. What a spirit to have. Amen. And so Paul was one of uh, 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 you know, the uh, instruments in the life of Stephanus in the household. As a matter of fact, he baptized Stephanus. And uh, we see that this epistle uh, was no doubt uh, written in such a way that the Apostle Paul would present these people as a example and it's not listen uh, it's not by accident that he uses fruit here indicating to us that the apostle paul's ministry was fruitful when god's grace is upon you fruit comes out it's it's a, it, you know, if you abide in christ and you continue in the grace of god you bear much fruit to the glory of god there's no doubt we must have some sort of fruit that takes place uh, some sort of fruit. There must be fruit in our ministry. There, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at the times where God has allowed us to be partakers in the ministry, to see fruit. It's not wrong to rejoice over fruit. As a matter of fact, Jesus says rejoice over the fruit in which God has given us by the laboring, if you will, of the ministry. And so we see here the Apostle Paul uses the word fruit. And... Um, if you notice 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you'll notice that the carnal Corinthians were divided. And they were divided at the fact that they were man followers. First of all, he says in verse 1, I, uh, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as carnal, even as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now you are able. See, he gave them the little dribs and drabs of the milk of God's word and they would not receive it. He didn't give them milk. And they were carnal. They had divisions among them. Chapter 1 talks about that division. They had about four divisions, different ones, saying we follow this person and that person. And Paul the Apostle tries to correct them. He says uh, in verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for as there is uh, envy and strife and division. And he says, uh, Are ye not carnal and walk as men? You're not spiritual. You're carnal. Uh, for one saith, I am of Paul, another of, uh, of Apollos. Are ye, ne, are ye, he says, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Isn't that a blessing? Yes. Ministers, servants, laborers, working in God's vineyard. That's a blessing. Amen. And he goes on to say, just to make sure that these people understand that we're nothing and God's the one that enables and gifts men for service. And he goes on to say, uh, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own, what's that word? Reward according to his own, what's that word? Labor. So we understand that there is some sort of partaking in the fruit when we labor. God will reward every man accordingly. Amen? It's there. It's right there for his what? Service or his labor or his ministry. And we see the first fruits, if you will, of Paul's labor. Stephanus and his household. And, and what a joy that is. Just to see people saved and serving. That's a joy. I mean, there's no greater joy than to see People come to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and they're on fire for the Lord. But the opposite is true, isn't it? When people reject the gospel, they don't even care about the gospel. Um, or people perhaps make a profession, but there's no fruit to show. There's no commitment. That, the opposite is true. It saddens you if you're in the ministry. It breaks your heart. But we see that they addicted themselves. Addicted, that's an interesting word, uh, to the ministering of the saints. So addicted, this word means to set or to a point or to a sign. Uh, in other words, they were resolved. They were resolved 
And uh, they set themselves to serve the people of God. And by the way, that's a healthy and lawful addiction. Amen. Set apart, assigned, set, appointed, ordained to the work of God. And in so doing, serving God's people. That's what the ministry involves. That's what ministry is all about. If you get sick of serving people, then you should get out of the ministry. Because ministry is about people. And they addicted themselves. He was resolved, set apart. Uh, and we know and understand that this can only be governed by an attitude that absolutely has a heart for God. No, there's no other way to explain their service and their addiction or their resolve but to say that they had a heart for God and in doing so is to have a heart for the ministry. You know what this tells me? That even among carnal churches and Christians, there were always those remnant and residue that have a heart for God and want to serve God. What a blessing that is. I've been to churches around different places in Australia and I've preached my heart out at, 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 you know, and I'm talking about preaching and preaching on sin. And all of a sudden you just see these little fiery Christians saying, praise God. And you see the carnal ones just avoid you and scatter. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, I've, it's happened all the time. You see these ones like, where has this been all my life? They just, they love the Lord. They're committed. They want this. Uh, it, you know, it, they don't have the attitude or you're pre preaching at me or preaching to me. They want the preaching because they're serving the Lord. Their heart is for God. They're addicted. They're assigned. They're approved to the very things that God is already doing in their heart. This attitude requires a purposeful decision. It's a determination to be committed. This wasn't an accident. This is not something that we slip into. This is purposeful. Uh, it's not a hit and miss attitude. Uh, you know, how the heart beats and keeps beating doesn't stop once it stops what happens you're finished now these people were consistent they addicted themselves they were firm and fixed this is why Paul is actually using the house of Stephanus because they had they had consistency in their life not one week they were here and the next week they were gone no 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 they were in their place or else Paul wouldn't use them and the Holy Spirit would not record it for us they were a mm, example of somebody that labored in the ministry of the saints and so What does it require? It requires obedience, doesn't it? I mean, the Bible does say in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God that walketh what? In you, both to do, both to will and to do of his good what? Pleasure. Pleasure. But is God going to do it without us yielding to the work of God in our lives? We must yield. There's a, there, there, there is a responsibility, listen very carefully, there is a responsibility of, in our part that we yield to the very, you know, work of God in our life. Yes, it's a work of grace. And yes, it's a work of God. But unless we yield to it, there's no fruit in our life. We must yield to the work of God in our life in order for us to be, look at, fruitful. Why are people fruitless? Because all they do is hear the word and never do the word. They're fruitless. They're not prosperous in the work. They look in the mirror, they hear the word of God, they say, great, and they walk away and do nothing. And they're fruitless. They don't obey what they hear. They become foolish builders, as Jesus puts it. But over here, we have a beautiful, beautiful testimony presented to us. You know, Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my what? Commandments. And as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul ends this chapter by saying in verse 22, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be a what? Anathema maranatha. Let him be a curse on judgment day. That's, that's, that's heavy. Because the love for God is the very key that keeps us committed to God. 
When you see someone not committed, the nuts and bolts to it is they don't love God like they should. That's it. I know there's a lot of complications and details, but at the end, you just have to conclude they're not loving God or they're not loving Jesus like they should. And over here, there's a sober warning that if anybody loved not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed on judgment day. Now, love is not just a fuzzy feeling that happens in our heart or words that we speak and say, I love you, I love you, and we're committed and we confess. And Listen, love is an action. Love works. It's not indifferent. And it can be seen. Love is an attitude of the heart that motivates a person to do the very things that they do. And this is why Jesus says, where your heart is, that's where your treasures are. Because what you're fond about, and what you are passionate about, and what you love, and what you treasure, there is the very thing that you desire. There's your heart. And there's no doubt you can step back and see the house of Stephanus and say, they love the Lord. It can be seen. A city on a hill cannot be hid. I'm not a, don't be ashamed, brethren, to love the Lord. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, let it be governed by grace and let it be governed by love and let it be governed by His mercy and wisdom and all for His glory if fruit will remain. Amen? Because we want fruit to remain. This is no doubt the same spirit that Joshua had. I mean, you look at the life of Joshua, at the end of his days, he was resolved to say among a carnal people, listen, you need to choose this day who you're going to serve. I'm resolved. My house, me and my house, we've made a decision. We will serve the Lord. What a testimony. That is one of the greatest testimonies. People have it on their walls. We do too, but may God have it stamped on our hearts. That we would say in this room, not only me, but my whole house will serve the Lord. Look at verse 16. Paul desires the church to submit themselves to those who support the ministry. This is an example to pursue, not only presented, but to follow after. Look at verse 16. That ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Not only Stephanus and his household, but anyone else that is laboring among you. Anyone else. And, and, and what are the examples that we find in Scripture? Well, we see in verse 19, we see Aquila and Priscilla see, uh, mentioned here. The church of, of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. You know where Paul the Apostle found Aquila and Priscilla? At Corinth. And they were tent making, they were in the tent making business. And the Apostle Paul, you know, uh, shared a common bond in their work and they got to know each other. As a matter of fact, he spent about, one, about a year and a half in their house. And so there, Aquila and Priscilla would have been laboring together with Paul amongst the Corinthians. And here you can see, again, Aquila and Priscilla saying, Tell them, perhaps, tell them we say hello. We salute you, amen, as carnal as they were. And there was a love not only for uh, God's workers, but for God's people. And we see that in a moment. But we see very clearly in other passages, as a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 16, you don't, you don't have to turn there for time, but the Bible says there, Great Priscilla uh, and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So Aquila and Priscilla had a ministry that was absolutely committed to the point where they were, li they were living and willing to give their lives for the cause of the ministry. Amen. What a blessing. Right. Not only this, but the uh, laborer Timothy was mentioned. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 10. Now, if... Uh, Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. What a blessing. Amen. He says, let no man therefore despise him, 
but conduct him forth in peace that he may come unto you, for I look for him with the brethren. You know what Paul was saying? Listen, I want to send Timotheus to you. He has the same heart as I do. He works the work of the Lord. Don't reject him. Receive him. Same thing with the household of Stephanus. As a matter of fact, Apollos is mentioned. Apollos is mentioned. You know, if you, we don't have time to go through all these examples, but if you see the life of Apollos, man, he was mighty in the script, eloquent, mighty in the scriptures. He was steadfast in teaching, and he had a teachable spirit. As a matter of fact, Aquila and Priscilla took him under his wing, and he learned and sat a more perf- and sat and learned about a more perfect way, because he was mighty in the scriptures regarding the Old Testament. And so there he was willing to learn more about the New Testament. And we're talking about here a laborer, a preacher, a teacher was willing to sit and learn. These are the kind of people that God uses and commends and lifts up and say, receive them, don't reject them, submit unto them. What a blessing. Follow after them. One of the greatest strengths, one of the greatest strengths to fellowship Uh, To leadership is fellowship. You know that. It is. The Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. As I look to Christ, you look to Christ. And over here he presents a caliber of people that want to work in the life of the Corinthians so they would be fruitful in their ministry and fruitful before God. And we see also, as we look into this verse 17, an example praised. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 17, he says, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. That was his crew. And he said, what was lacking, what you didn't, you know, simply have to give, they made the difference. Now, I'm glad he, he pray, there's a rejoicing that took part in the Apostle Paul's life because of these three men. Now, these other men that were with Stephanus perhaps would have been in his household, perhaps family members or friends. We're not really sure. But they were with him and they were committed and Paul is so glad that these men would not only come to work out differences and problems and issue within the church. Listen, it was more than that. But they'll come and be a blessing to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 16, 18, For they have refreshed my spirit, and look at this, and yours. They're not only a blessing to the preacher or the apostle, but they're absolutely a blessing to you. I mean, these men were the cream of the crop of men that served and labored and helped for the work of the Lord, and you could not miss it. It's unbelievable how it lift them up and commend them before the Lord. I'm glad they refreshed me, uh, refreshed my spirit and yours. In other words, they were like a breath of fresh air. Man, they're just a breath of fresh air. Thank God for people that are just a breath of fresh air. It's like the the fulfillment of the Proverbs, amen. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs 25, 25, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Man, they're good news. They're coming. I'm glad they came. What a blessing. What a blessing to have them around. What a blessing they've been to you, and what a blessing they've been to me. What a blessing. There's nothing wrong with being a blessing. Amen, as long as it's done for the glory of God. I mean, over here, let another man praise thee, amen. He's just lifting them up and they're not praising themselves. He's just lifting them up and there's, hey, give honor where honor is due, my friend. Amen? Amen. Praise, man, refreshment. Think about it. I mean, the Apostle Paul, I mean, who wants to hang around with him? The Apostle Paul knew that not a lot of people wanted to hang around him. He knew that. They were were ashamed of his bonds and chains. One particular time they fled from him. He had to stand alone, but but he said, but the Lord was with me. 
mean, you had, you had the Apostle Paul that was just persecuted for the truth, misunderstood, accused. Even the Corinthians themselves were challenging his apostleship and his love for them. Imagine that. And you had these men, these spiritual men, these laborers, these lovers of the Lord coming and being a blessing to the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine that would be a, a breath of fresh air? Just like, man. These men were absolute blessings. They were loyal men to the truth, to the cause of Christ, and to the God-appointed apostle. Because to be faithful to the God-appointed apostle is to be faithful to God. And he's simply saying to the Corinthians, receive them. Submit yourselves unto them. These are laborers and these are helpers. These are, this is for your edification. We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. To hang around with the Apostle Paul was a huge thing. I mean, it was a huge thing. If you look at the life of Paul, it was a huge thing. But these men... I, at any moment, mate, I'm not in the show. I just I want to be a blessing. But for the most part, men didn't want to be around the Apostle Paul. This kind of reminds me of Jeremiah's ministry. If you look at Jeremiah's ministry, he had all odds against him. He had a lot of people that were against him. Princes, brethren, countrymen that were against his ministry. I mean, if you want to turn that, I want to use this as an example and I want to point out something very clear here that would be a blessing to you. Go to Jeremiah chapter 37. In Jeremiah 34, you don't have to turn there out. We find Jeremiah prophesied as Zedekiah, the king of Jerusalem, uh, the king to the king that Jerusalem will be taken by the Babylonians. He says that specifically. As a matter of fact, that was the thrust of his prophecy. And that Nebuchadnezzar will come against them and destroy Jerusalem and will burn it up. That was his prophecy. Imagine prophesying that, judgment. Imagine being a prophet, prophesying impending judgment. In chapter 37, he warns the king, Zedekiah. He warns him about impending judgment. He basically finds himself confronting the king and not only saying to the king that there's you know, uh, judgment coming upon Jerusalem, but there's, you're going to be taken. You, king, you're going to be overthrown. And the whole point of Jeremiah saying this is that you just need to yield with God's prophecy. Don't fight against it. Submit yourself unto it. Don't, don't, don't try to fight the Babylonians. Just, hey, listen, you guys have rebelled and God's judgment's coming. You are going to be in captivity. King, just submit yourself under and you'll be fine. And that was this tug of war that was taking place because Israelites wanted to continue to rebel. Listen, even in the time of judgment. God is saying you're going to be judged, but I'll still spare you if you submit to that kind of judgment. And, that, and, and for the most part, some of them were just, just defiant. And this is the, the struggle that Jeremiah was taking place. If you know anything about the warning ministry, it is a hard ministry. And yet you trace the Apostle Paul's life, part of his ministry was warning people. In Acts chapter 20, verse 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. There's a warning ministry. And I don't have a winning ministry and a witnessing ministry, but there's a warning ministry. We warn people of God's impending judgment. And listen, folks, it is probably the toughest ministry to have. But listen, it's needful because it's true. The wrath of God's going to come. And people can be so stiff-necked as you want to be. The wrath of God is going to be poured out. But God doesn't want it to be poured out upon those people. That he wants all men everywhere to what? Repent. And that's another ugly word that people don't like. But I, I believe it's a beautiful word because it shows God's favor and mercy to say, listen, God will spare you. Just obey. Just repent. Just come back. Praise God for that. But these people continued to be defiant. Get a rebellion. Look at verse 2. 
But neither he or his servants, Jeremiah 37, nor the people of the land did hearken unto the words of the Lord, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. And now King Hezekiah asks Jeremiah to, to intercede for them, to pray, pray for us, pray for me. What do, you want, what, what do you want me to pray? Why don't you just obey? And there's nothing I could do. God said his word is true. He's, got, he's going to do what he's going to do. In verse 3, at the latter part, he says, Pray now that the Lord our God for us. And the response comes back. Look at verse 9. Thus saith the Lord, deceive not yourself, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us. Don't deceive yourself. The Chaldeans are not going to depart from you. Hey, they're going to go fix up Egypt, but they're coming back again. Don't think that they're going to go and just be occupied with Egypt. They're going to Egypt, but they're coming back again. They're coming to destroy you. Have a look. He, he says it very clearly. For they shall not depart. Look, listen, I don't want to lose you here. What am I trying to do? There's a tough ministry that's taking place, a very lonely ministry, and the life of Jeremiah, similar to the life of the Apostle Paul. I want you to get this. I want you to stay with me for a moment. Look, uh, look at verses 11 and 21. We see Jeremiah leave Jerusalem to go to a personal task. He ends up being arrested and imprisoned in a dungeon. For what, for what purposes? For they thought that he was kind of deserting them. He was leaving them. Well, this is a false accusation by the princes of Israel. And, and later on, we're going to see it was a false accusation because they didn't like his prophecy. He was going to do whatever he was going to do, but he wasn't deserting them. He wasn't running away and just prophesying and running away. They falsely accused him and put him in the dungeon. Now think about that for a moment. And like his preaching, they didn't like his prophecy. They didn't like what thus saith the Lord came out of the Jeremiah. They found something to pin him on. And that's, listen, isn't that the work of the devil? Just pinning, 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 pinning on something that is not really the problem of the heart. Surface stuff. Surface stuff. But really deep down, what's taking place is they reject and hate Jeremiah's message. And what's that mean? They hate God's message. The only reason they were in captivity because they kept on rejecting the prophets. And they'll kill them and stone them. And in doing so, they'll reject God's word. They want to hear. They didn't want to hearken. They were stiff-necked. And Stephen testified to that. He says, you're just like your fathers. You resist the Holy Spirit. And they stoned him to death. What was he, what's Stephen doing there? Warning? It's not just preaching the gospel, but it's warning people from impending danger. That's part of the gospel, don't you think? But it's not popular. It's tough, but it's misunderstood. Very misunderstood. I mean, I'm talking about you can't, even, you can't even fathom that kind of ministry of how much it's misunderstood in our day today. But look at verse 17. Actually, look, look at verse 15. I want, I want you to see verse 15 first. He says, Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah, and what, what did they do? Smote him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe. For they had made that the prison. Can you imagine that? Jonathan described there's a little place there, a little prison cell for Jeremiah the prophet. I mean, my word, come on. Think about that for a moment. I mean, what, kind of God, what kind of God's people are these? What kind of believers are these? Filling out the man of God. Rejecting him. And then... Verse 17, then Zedekiah the king. After many days, Zedekiah calls for Jeremiah to hear what the Lord had to say. And again, Jeremiah once again boldly announces that the Babylonians will capture the city and the king. And the message didn't change. Look at verse 17. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took word out. And the king asked him secretly in the house. And he said, is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, there is. For he... For said he, thou shalt be delivered into the hands of the king of... It hasn't changed. Yeah. Still the same. Yeah. Same word from God. What's going to take place will take place. In verse 18, 19, we see the real reason why Jeremiah was put in prison. 
Look at, moreover, Jeremiah said unto the king Zedekiah, What have I offended against thee, or against thy servants, or against thy people, that ye have put me in prison? Where are now your prophets, which prophesy unto you, saying, The king of Babylon shall not come against you, nor against this land? Where are they? Where are they? I prophesy, thus saith the Lord, you have your prophets saying, Peace, peace, where there is no peace. Conflicting messages. And I believe today... We're living in a day and age where there is a lot of false teachers and preaching uh, that's taking place today. This greasy grace. Preaching all grace and love and prosperity. And if you dare to preach against uh, sin and, the, and judgment to come, then you're a legalist or you're an unloving bigot. Man, you can speak about the love of God and the grace of God till your, your hair turns grey, it falls off, and people will love it. But as soon as you preach on sin and judgment and repent, the people cringe. Why? It would be a blessing of a sermon if you just take heed and do it. It would be a blessing to you if you embrace the word of God. And Jeremiah asks the king to be released from prison and ironically the king gives him leave. He was committed to the court of the prison, taken out of the dungeon, at least the court of the prison was a better place to be than the dungeon and was given a piece of bread every day, a dry morsel, can you imagine that? Here we have a prophet preaching the word of God, feeding on a piece of bread outside of the prison, uh, uh, in the court. Of the prison. Look at verse uh, chapter 38. King Zedekiah now throws Jeremiah under the bus. What's going on in the heart of the king? I mean, he's betwixt because the king knows. Listen, if you read this account, I don't have time, but the king knows. The king, the king knows. I mean, he, he knows what Jeremiah is saying is true, but he's afraid. If you, if you look at this account, you'll understand he's fearful. And he's afraid of the princes because later on he wanted to have a little private discussion with Jeremiah. And then later on he says, Jeremiah, don't tell the princes that we've had this discussion. So there's fear. It reminds me a little bit like Pilate. He knew the truth, but then he just threw Jesus under the bus. And there are God's people that know the truth, my friends, but won't stand up for it. But there are those that do. And this is what I want to preach about this tonight. This refreshment that you stand with those that preach and declare the truth, that live the truth. Those examples, those people that love the Lord. There's so many times you see people just thrown under the bus because of fear. They want to be just popular. Or whatever reason, you want to, they're just thrown under the bus. It's sad, isn't it? Have a look. The princes of Israel approach the king and demand Jeremiah's death. And the hands of Jeremiah, he hands him over. Now why did they want Jeremiah dead? Look at verse 4. Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus he hath weakened the hands of the men of war that remaineth in the city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt, and we know the opposite is true. Isn't that disgusting? King, you know, Jeremiah's not for the people. As a matter of fact, he wants to ruin them. The opposite is true. And, but you know what? They persuaded him. Listen, they were taken by their dissimulation. And how is it? That people are easily persuaded by those that are carnal and perhaps they don't even care about God. And you can see they have their own agenda. These princes wanted to go against God's prophecy. As a matter of fact, if you did, see you later, goodbye. You would not be spared. At least if you submitted yourself, you'd be a slave under the Babylonian king and you'd still live to see the day, at least for your children, to prosper. And God returned the promise to them. But no, they want to still rebel and still be moved by the dissimulation and hypocrisy of those that do not care about God's people, that only care about themselves. 
Why did they want Jeremiah dead? Verse, look at verse 5. Then Hezekiah, the king said, Behold, he's in your hand. For the king is not he that can do anything against you. Whoa. Reminds me of John Huss. Anyone know the story of John Huss? Back in the Reformation, John Huss was preaching the truth of the gospel and his, his message was very simple to the Pope and to the, to the Archbishop. You know, what, you know what was his message? We're saved by grace through faith alone. Not through the sacraments. Not by works. And you know what? They put him before the whole clergy and people and even the king. They persuaded the king to put him to death, to burn him to the stake, to count him as a heretic. For what? For preaching the truth. The king, when it came, the king was sticking up for him. He actually, at one point, was standing up. He says, that's not, that's not John Huss. He's for the people. You, re you read his biography. I'll tell you, it's history records it. One of the greatest testimony in history is that I've just simply... Back in my day when I was suffering through this persecution of being misunderstood because of simply want to believe that there's only one mediator between God and man. You read his testimony. The king was for him and later on he was persuaded by the Pope and others. And that there when he was at trial he looked at the king and the king turned his face away. And they burnt him to the stake. They gave him one more chance to recant and he wouldn't. As a matter of fact, John Huss was burnt to the stake singing a hymn. And he sung, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. On you, John Huss. Strange thing would have been taking place in his heart. For what? For preaching the truth and only the truth. Man, well, he gets thrown under the bus. Jeremiah was cast not only in a prison, but in a muddy dungeon. As a matter of fact, the Bible records that there was no water. He was put in a dungeon, like perhaps Joseph, you know, was put by his brothers, you know, in, in, thrown in the well alike, but there's no water in this. It's all mud, and he sinks in. And I want you to see something very special. I mean, this is where it, this is the climax. I don't want you to miss this. Jeremiah is stuck in the mud, no water, no help. The king's against him. There's no one for him. I mean, alone, ready to die. And lo and behold, Stephanus comes along. Not Stephanus, but someone like him. I tell you. Just out of nowhere. What was he? A servant of the king. Just a servant. I want you to see this in Jeremiah 38 and look at verse 7. Now when Abed-Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sit sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Abed-Melech went forth out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have done what? Evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. And so Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison until the fall of of Jerusalem. In other words, by this request, he gives Edom Milik the green light to go and rescue Jeremiah out of the pit. And he goes and he gets ropes and, you know, they just tie him up on, you know, they, they just get these ropes, uh, these rags, if you will, and they tie him up and they, they just lower him down and they said, just put him under your armpits puts them under the armpits and they start willing him up. Can you just, I mean, think about the effort that's taking place here. I mean, it's not an easy thing. Can you imagine the princes hearing about this? I mean, the king didn't want to, he'd just say, hey, just go ahead, just 
Go ahead. Spare his life. And he goes and he risks his life to save Jeremiah. He risks his own neck to save Jeremiah. Who's Jeremiah to him? Who is he? We're going to see in a moment. Have a look. Look at chapter 39. Because of this courage, listen, because of this addiction, resolve this uh, commitment, if you will, this stand that he makes. Notice the reward that God himself gives him by the word of Jeremiah. Have a look. Notice the blessing given here. But we also see the governing factor which motivated and encouraged the prophet. What motivated him to do it? We're going to see that as well. But we're going to see God blessing him. But in the blessing, toward the end, we're going to see a motivating factor. Why did this man stand up for the prophet? Risk his own life. Be a refreshment to him. Why? For what purpose? Personal gain. No, have a look. Look at verse 15. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison. Now this is in the court of the prison. He's out of the dungeon again, saying, Go and speak to Eben Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Imagine that, getting a personal letter from God, a word from God. Man, I don't know about you, but that would be, wow. God wants to speak to me. And by the way, it's good news. Amen. It's not judgment. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. Now, I want to be on that end. And by the way, Christians, we can't. It's the whole purpose of the sermon. That we follow after these men. Stephanus, this household. People like Abed-Melech. Amen. Have a look. Go and speak, verse 16, to Abed-Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon the city for evil. And not for good. And they shall be accomplished in that day before thee. But look at the conjunction, verse 17. But I will deliver thee in the day, saith the Lord. And thou shall be, uh, they shall not be given into the hand of men of whom art thou afraid. For I will surely deliver thee. And thou shalt not fall by the sword. But thy life shall be for a prey unto thee. Because, why? Thou hast put thy trust in me saith the lord men of faith nothing more nothing less why did abed abed milik rescue the prophet because he believed god and in believing god he believed his word and he was willing to be strong and be a man and not be fearless, be courageous and bold and side with those that preach the truth and proclaim the truth. What was the motivation? Because I believe God. I trust the Lord. God is faithful. I trust him. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Men of faith. You know what this reminds me of? For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know, Jeremiah, God hasn't forgotten about you. God hasn't forgotten about you. Even though your ministry to God's people is misunderstood. This reminds me of Hebrews 11. I'd rather suffer affliction. Was what Moses says, choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than that treasures in Egypt. Praise God. What I want to serve the king, serve the king, give him his cup, give him his... I'm willing to risk my life for the truth. I'm willing to lay down my life for those that preach the word. What a way to die, my friend. Yeah. Why? Because he just believed God. It reminds me of one of... One Nisiphorus, I think it, it, that's how you pronounce it. Have a look at Second Timothy, just quickly as we wrap it up. We're almost done. Second Timothy. I mean, if you just find something that is so encouraging, you see the life of this man also. One of. Have a look. Second Timothy, chapter one.
Look at this. Look at chapter 1. Look at verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of one of us. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very, what's that word? Diligently and found me. Man, he didn't just look for Paul. Man, he searched high and low to find the dropkick. Yeah. To find the scum of the earth. Because, you know, this part, you know, Paul was persecuted for the fact that he was in prison. Paul was considered to be a troublemaker by his own countrymen, by those religious nuts. I mean, do you, who do you think hand him over to the government? Who, I mean, come on. Let's, let's, it was the religious rulers. They set him up. They're the ones that brought him before the governors. They wanted him dead. And time and time again, we see that take place, even in the book of Acts and the life of the disciples. You think the heathen? It was the, it was the professing people that put him in the hand of the heathen. Isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? But, he, but look at verse 17. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he might find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Timothy, you know. One of Forrest and his house, you know how they've been a blessing to me. He wasn't ashamed of my chains. As a matter of fact, he sought me diligently. He's been a blessing to me time and time and time again. And the Bible says, submit yourselves unto such. If you're not going to submit yourselves to people that preach and labor and not ashamed of the gospel and come under, who do we have to submit ourselves to? You tell me. We're not going to get thus sight the Lord out there, my friends. Not no way in the world. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. And you're not going to get thus saith the Lord from a carnal Corinthian. Who are you going to get it from? Men that are resolved. Women that are resolved to stand courageously and fearlessly and addicted themselves to the work of God. Yep. May God help us follow after such people. Amen. Let's pray.